ask and plead, Lord, that you would just bless us, that, Lord, you would give us insight into your word, that, Lord, our, as it were, the doors to our hearts would be opened up, and, Lord, that we may have your word flush through us, Lord. Lord God, your word is sharp, active, able to, able to separate, Lord, the sin and draw us out of our life. Lord God, I ask tonight you would just bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, last week we started out. Can we turn them over? No. Thank you. If you're in my last release, don't open my Bible test. yet. Scan it. <laughs> last week we started off with, a, with not, too, not too much fun. We started off defining sin or asking what your concept of sin was. Well, this week we're going to talk about no. No. the love. Oh. No. So, when you hear love, what goes off in your head? When you hear someone say, I love you, or I love God. Someone says, I love God. I just love God. What defines inside your head? Fireworks. Fireworks. Okay. Bill. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> is it near an anniversary? Can I just ask that question? <laughs> Are you trying to get points? What can I say? <laughs> I'm so humble. <laughs> but what, what do you think when someone says, "I" or you know, someone says, I, "I just love God"? What concept do you have of what they're talking about? I have. I, you did good last week. I, yes. <laughs> I have this little plaque, I had it, I don't know where it is now, but my great aunt Mary gave me. And I, it goes over and over in my head because it said, God is love. Well, I was right. just a young child when she gave me that. But as time went on, you can read that backward, forward and backwards. God is love, and love is God. And, you know, it's, it's, and that's okay we're, in my head. Mm -hmm. okay we're, we're going to get to that the interchangeability if we get if we if we get to it tonight we're going to get to that interchangeability of the two words okay anybody else now that i've been a christian for a while unselfishness love equals unselfishness okay. love equals bill <laughs> <laughs> No, it's on top. Okay. Bill you, got, you got it up there. You put equal in front of Bill Fireworks. Bill minus fireworks. He's Bill minus fireworks. What else? What else? Obedience. Obedience? Mm. It's not like rules. Mm. Yeah, I kind of like if you love me, keep my commandments. <laughs> We didn't ask for ad living. It's her floor. <laughs> but the two are one. True. Well, that, that's true. The lesson that is true. <laughs> that is true. How important is this? How important? Very. Okay. If you were to say the scale is from zero to ten, verses in the Bible, verses about love, especially in First John, where do you think they rank? Zero being, eh, you know, it doesn't relate to me. Ten. A hundred. A hundred. Yes. Oh. A hundred? Okay. How important is this? It's pretty important. The Mucho. Number one. It's very important. Mucho. How many weeks did you teach on love out of First John? Probably about 20. It was a few. So. Yeah. That's very important. It's very important we get it right, or at least understand what we're talking about. And that's what we're going to do tonight, is talk... You can, you can, you can do everything good, and if you don't do it with love, you... It's worthless. Worthless. It's, it's worthless. Playing it's like a gong. gong. Like a clanging gong. Exactly. Did not say turn it over. He was saying. You can turn it over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, love is supposed to be an identifying mark for Christians. It's supposed to be a key... You can turn it over now, Sherry. Oh, thank okay. You were going to rebel and not turn it over. That's fine. Go for it. But it is supposed to be something that we are known by, right? Does anyone know John 13, um, 34 by heart? If not, except for the pastor. <laughs> 
Psalm 1334. Who's got that real quick? Okay, ready, set, go. Who can get there the fastest? We got it. It's all mentioned. Melissa! No. No. A new Sorry. commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Okay, here we go. Melissa, out loud again. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Let me ask you a quick question. Who said that? Jesus. I think it's Jesus. Jesus. We have a red letter Bible. It's in red. It's in bold red. Mine's just the nearly inspired, so it doesn't have nearly? a Oh, that's right. You don't have a red letter. Yeah. yeah. Jesus said that we are to do what to one another? Love. We're supposed to fight and fuss and have little wars? No. Love. Love. Okay. Well... <clears throat> One of the, remember, we talked about some of the heresies that were ongoing at that time. Okay? If you can remember, there was a Harry called... Harry Potter? Harry Potter. Nope. There was a heresy called Docet... Uh, I'm having real trouble with the mouth. You know. Doceticism. Doceticism. Thank you. It just wasn't coming out. Doceticism. Remember what that was? That Jesus wasn't real, that he was an apparition, kind of like, ooh, phantom. you know, phantom. So it wasn't anybody real died. There was no bloodshed, which just undermines the entirety of the gospel about propitiation. I said it, didn't I, lady? <laughs> <laughs> the second was Gnosticism. Remember what Gnosticism was? What was it? Bill, you guys watched a movie on it. You could tell us about Gnosticism. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, higher knowledge. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that you you could be freed from this mortal body and get to a next plane through knowledge. I don't have to give my life to Jesus. All I do is just memorize the Bible and I'm there. No, no, that is not true. But that's the Gnostics. What was another one? Serinthianism. Now, if you mentioned... What was that? Was it, it was a story. I think John Scott had his book about... Of course, it's not... Where there, John ran out. John, yeah, John went into uh, somewhere and heard this. Sorrento. Sorrento was in there and ran out because he said it's, it's, it's an apostasy to be in the same building with him. He was an enemy of John's. But what did he teach? Do you remember? He taught that Jesus didn't die on the cross. That basically, there was this man named Jesus. He led a good life. And at baptism, the spirit, Jesus, came and was upon him to right before the cross. And he took off and then that guy died on the cross. But that God in the form of Jesus didn't die. He can't kill God, which is a heresy. Because then who died on the cross? He, he had to have had sin because he had the what? The Adamic nature, the inherited sin. No one born from Adam can be sinless. So therefore, someone with sin died on the cross and their blood is no, of no good, no use to me. And then there was antinomianism. Remember what that was? Without law. Anti hmm? Without law. Without law. And what was it? Hey, my sins are paid for. I can go sin. They're paid for. I don't have to be held to any laws or any rules. All this was swirling around. Now, can you imagine what would happen in this church if one of those started popping up? We would immediately have factions within the church. And there would be the Wayne faction and there would be the Serenth faction. And they would be fighting. Or maybe they would be a church next door and we're fighting with each other. You think there was a lot of love going on? No. When there's heresies popping up like this, it usually doesn't do well as far as, as, far as love. And it causes what's called a schism. <coughs> a schism. A schism, the Greek word is schisma or schisma, which is there in the first paragraph. And it's used in 1 John 2.19 in several places. The word schism literally means to tear apart. It's like me take... Well, I don't have any extra paper here. Yeah, I do. It's like me taking this, this paper. This paper is whole. This paper is whole. Now it's got a schism. It's torn apart. Torn apart. Violently. There's damage. And probably didn't feel good if it had nerves and was alive. I'm not saying that the paper is alive. Um, but schisms, a cleft palate, the word in Greek is schism, which means it's separated, um, split, division. It's used in Matthew, John, you can look those up, and in Corinthians. Uh, it's used eight times in the New Testament, but it's used here in John about this apostasy, this heresies that were going on. 
But what I want us to do, and why we started off talking about love, is let's make sure we understand what we're talking about when we talk about love. Okay? Because we're going to get into love big time here in a minute. There are six words for love in Greek. Right, Wayne? Is it six or is it seven? I think it's six. I believe it's six. I believe there's six. Up down in your book. Yeah, there's six word, Greek words for love, but only three. Thank you, Sherry, for eating head. <laughs> There's, that's fine. There's only three used in the New Testament. Agapeo, phileo, and storge. In 1 John, the only Greek word that's used is agapeo, or its derivatives. Agape, agapeo, agapos, but they're all derivatives of the same word. It's the only one used in 1 John. So we're not mixing, like in some parts of the New Testament, you've got to be careful, because it may be talking about brotherly love, phileo, city of Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. That's how I remember it. <laughs> Filet. And in the same sentence, you may have agape. Not true in 1 John. It is all agape. It's only talking about one kind of love. So that's what we're going to dig into. Okay. So agapeo, right there in the middle, is means to love or loving. And agape is a noun. And actually, W.E. Vine, uh, if, if you don't have it, get Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Terms. It's out of print, but if you can catch it on Google for under about 20 bucks, get that book. If you don't have it, Amazon. It, I mean, Amazon, excuse me, Amazon. It is a great resource that if you really are confused about a, a verse in the Bible, instead of going to commentary, go to Vines and look up the root word, the roots of the words. And, and it, it sometimes it makes a whole lot more sense to me. But anyway, W. Vine, uh, let's see, we're going we're gonna to go counterclockwise. Melissa, why don't you read what W. Vine says there about this word, agapeo. Agapeo expresses the deep and constant love and interest of a perfect being towards entirely unworthy objects, producing and fostering a reverential love in them towards the giver and a practical love towards those who are partakers of the same and a desire to help others seek the giver. Now, this is W. Vine. This is not scripture. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to treat it like scripture and take it apart and understand it at all. But, but what is he basically saying? Read, read that again one more time, Melissa. Deep and constant love and interest of a perfect being towards entirely unworthy objects, producing and fostering a reverential love in them towards the giver, and a practical love towards those who are partakers of the same, and a desire to to help others seek the giver. All right, what does this say to you? Basically what? that it's perfect God giving us love, which... Okay, um, okay let's stop right there. Okay. That's, that's the first part of it. Perfect God bestowing love upon us. Okay? And we're entirely unworthy. And, and we're entirely unworthy. Exactly. And remember when we, for those of you who are in home fellowship groups, remember when we went through God's names and the character of God, how a holy, perfect God can't be in the presence of an unholy sinful something. Something's got to happen. He's either got to change the rules, which is to change his, his nature, which he's not going to do, or somehow pay for those sins. Hence comes propitiation in Jesus on the cross. I said it again, Lydia. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> She's keeping track. <laughs> She's counting them. <laughs> so, so, unworthy beings, what else is in there? What else is in there? Uh, it produces a love in return from those receiving it. You ever seen a baby, whether it's I know you have, but you ever watched a little baby when it hears its mother's voice? It just, it, it's just like the, the rest of the world can disappear. That baby is locked in, and you could just see the that that feeling towards that mother. Why? Because the mother has first shown it to the baby has cared for the baby, has provided for the baby, is the is life for the baby. The mother doesn't feed it. You know, so the baby realizes this, and so there's a relationship there of providing everything for the life of that baby, and that baby just it just flows out of the baby. That's a good example of what it's what it's like with God. God bestowed on us and our gratitude should swell up. I mean every time there's several songs that I hear, but there's one by uh, Hillsong uh, about so will I. Have you guys heard that about hundred billion times? Okay, go. Hmm? Sing it to I am, Yeah, right. I'm going to sing it. We'll have an empty room. Go Google it. Hillsong it, it, United. It, it is really amazing. And and pay attention. There's pay attention to the words. 
it is, I, I, I can't get through it without my heart just wanting to bust. Just, oh my word, what he has bestowed on us. So that is the first part of this. What's the other part of this? Makes them want to, the ones who have received, to give out to others and show. Before that. Well, before that. Before that. And have the same affection towards the same. Because I see in you that God's done it to you. It's like, wow, you're, you're, you're part of this. And, and it just builds a natural love for believers. And then evangelism. I, I, I just got to share this. I just got to share this. That's what agapeo is. That's what it describes. Okay. So, what's the source? I mean, here he said, you know, I mean, he pointed out that the key to his whole thing is what's the source. And we're going to go there. Adrian, 1 John 4, 7. We're going to go there. Okay, now I think we'll be in, almost entirely in 1 John. 1 John 4, 7. Adrian, what is the source of our agape? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Go ahead and read it, because that's the end of that okay. song. <laughs> uh, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Remember the song from yep. the 70s? Love one another, love is... Okay, remember that one? Uh-huh. Melissa, you, you, you can hold a tune. I'm... I remember the DC talk one. Love, love, love is a verb. Uh, well, I wasn't... <laughs> Sorry, Adrian. That's a little after my time. <laughs> but that, that was put to music back in the 70s. It was a, it was a great worship song in the 70s. But what's the source? Uh, the word there for love is agape. And again, 1 John, it's all agape. What's the source of agape? God. God, God is the author and perfecter of agape. Okay. It's also defined for us in two other verses in John. Um, Jenny, if you'll go to 1 John 4, 9. Uh-huh. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Okay. And all right, 1 John 3, 16. <clears throat> we know what real love is because Jesus gave up His life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Okay. So, by these few verses, how do we define love? God's love, how do we define it? What, if you had to summarize it real him. quick. If you, from him. It's from him. But what's a characteristic of it that was described in these verses? Other oriented. Pardon? It's other oriented. Giving up of yourself. Two-way street. Yeah. Giving up yourself. Two-way street. But no, God's love, how did he best demonstrate that love to us? Yes. 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 Propitiation. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. Exactly. Three times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We should take back next weekend. <laughs> well, it'll be Wayne. I don't know if they'll be using it. But, but that is the greatest demonstration of love. Is that he chose. How far back did he make this choice? From the beginning. From the beginning. From the beginning, he laid down this plan. Okay. Now, remember, John writes in contrasting absolutes. Remember that? It's a characteristic of the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John. Uh, what's some of the con- what's some of the absolute contrasting absolutes he uses? Light and dark. Light and dark. No gray in between. Light, dark. And just think of five thousand watt light or pitch black. That that's it. Nothing in between. What else? Life and death. Life and death. Yes, life and death. Life. The absence of life. Bill, you're reading. What's next? <laughs> truth, truth and falsehood. Truth and falsehood. Yeah. It's either true or it's a lie. It's not, well, depends on the context. No. Here he uses contrasting again in this epistle. And let's go to 1 John 2 9. I think we, you know, we didn't already read it. Uh, Wayne, if you've got that, 1 John 2 9. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness until now. Whoa! Now wait a minute. Now wait a minute. Now, 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 now we're getting in my closet, you know. I mean, this is getting real personal here. The one who says he's in the light yet hates his brother. The word for hate is the word misio. And it literally means to hate, to regard ill will, to detest, 
or one of the words I love that God uses, I mean, they use about, God uses in the Old Testament is to abhor. Abhor is worse than hate. It's just like, uh, I mean, I mean it's, it's emotion. It's, it's just, you, oh, you can't stand it. So it is a contrast we're seeing. We're seeing hate and we're seeing love being contrasted in the same way as light and dark, sin and truth, etc. Okay, so what is, if someone has hate, what does that verse say about them? Hate towards a brother. What does that say about, about that person? They're not safe. They're in the darkness. They're in the darkness. Now, 1 John 2.9, this is on top of your handout, page 2. According to that verse, and we'll be graded on this now, check the box. The one who hates is in the light or in the darkness? In the darkness. In the darkness, okay. And therefore, it also, remember, one thing about the Bible, one thing about the Bible is, if it states something is true, then the opposite is also true. If there's only one way to God, and that's to the man Christ Jesus... That means there's no other way to God. Okay. So, by inference of that, then he who's in the light does what? Loves. Loves. Okay. Now, this is this is basement Christianity, but it is so fundamental, I think. And it is so easy for us to get awry on this because emotions start flailing into this situation. All right. So, let's get into the first epistle and look at it, love. First, love defined. Uh, Jerry, 1 John 3.16. Let's start getting some definitions of how 1 John... Okay, the Holy Spirit through the pen of John to this church in Asia Minor. How is he defining love? 1 John 3. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. How is that defining love for us? What is it saying? Laying down your life. Laying down your life. Just like the, he sent the Messiah came. Okay. Specifically for one purpose, that's to die. First, <clears throat> first to show that he was the Messiah and then to die on, on our behalf. But this is the kind of attitude. If I am truly, truly right in the center of his will, right in the center, just absolutely bathing in his love to me, and someone walked in this room with a handgun and said, I'm going to kill one Christian, I should be the first in line saying, take me out of love for you guys because I see God in you. Does this make sense? You, you ever wondered why people did things like that? It, it's that kind of depth of a feeling. Okay, 1 John 4, 8 and 10. Edie. Yes, I, yes you, you can look ahead and get prepared as, a, as opposed to last week. <laughs> the one who does not love does not know God for God is loved. By this love by this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation <laughs> for our sins. Amen to that propitiation. Sum this up. God first loved us, so yes. He sent His Son so that we could go... Exactly. But if you want a good definition of agapeo, <clears throat> verses 8 through 10. That's it. That shows us what it should be like. Okay. 1 John 4, 16. Bill. We have come to know to have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. What's this telling us? <laughs> no, it's not. It is. <laughs> let, let me answer it this way. Okay, I grew up. I grew up in this. I was a teenager in the sixties. So was Bill, and so was Wayne, Sherry, Melissa. You know, early teens, teenagers. Remember? Oh, you know, I'm, I just love everybody. Okay, was that God? So is any love God? 
<laughs> but then there's a real love what? is gone. Harley says that was drugs. <laughs> that, that, well, that was drugs, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, people are confused about this very issue. People are confused. They, they think because they have some sort of feeling about church or feeling that, that that's agapeo. It's, no, it's not a feeling. It is. Feelings come in, but feelings get swept into this like a large ship moving through the water and stuff gets swept up behind it. Feelings get swept up behind agapeo. Agapeo is on a spiritual level. It really is. I, I, I feel it. And this, this idea that because, oh, we'll just... We just love each other. That's God. No. It's phileo. It's erotico. It's a lot. It could be a lot of things. But it's not agape. It's not. Okay. Um, Okay, again, we're going to go back through what's the source. Uh, Okay. I'm going to step on my own toes here. I usually do... If you want to know what's going on in my life, just wait, look at what I'm writing and hear what I'm teaching. You know, no, Paul's been, he's stomping on his own toes because I usually share where I'm, I'm having struggles or hurts. I hope it's not me. Have, no, good for you. Well, it's right there. Right here, right yeah. here, sure. Have you ever, I said, I hope it's not me. Have you ever heard right someone say, I just can't love that person? I've heard them say more that they don't can't like that person. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard too many people say they can't love them. Or have a hard time loving that person. Mm-hmm. That one. I've heard that a lot. Heard that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go to First John two four through six. Who is up next on deck nine? Don's on deck. The man who says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Okay. This is my WWJD moments. (laughs) What would Jesus do? It's a trite saying from the 90s or whenever that was. It's so truthful. It is such a truthful thing. If someone walked in this room that I did not like, and I'm like, I just can't like that person or love that person, what would Jesus do? My word. He went to the tax gatherer's house. He talked to the, to the Samaritan woman at the well. These things, in the scope of eternity, in the scope of right relationship with God, this had no meaning. I'm constantly having to say what would Jesus do in this situation? And we're to walk as he walked. Can you imagine Jesus going, oh, I'm not going there because, oh, someone's over there. No. No. This is a call for us to arm ourselves against the wiles of the enemy. First, to hold something against a brother or to not love a brother or to speak ill of a brother. I can't see Jesus in the gossip chain. Well, let me tell you what they did last week. Oh, I, I, I can't see that. I can't see that. So the end of this verse says what? We ought to walk in the same manner as he walked. Now he's capitalizing the American standard. I'm not sure about the NIV. They NIB. just put Jesus on. They there. put Jesus. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But folks, this is a call. This is a call to righteous living. Imagine what's going on in that church. They had heresies popping up. People can't fight against each other. And he's saying, wait a minute. You will know if you're of the light because you will have light pouring out of you and it's and it's love to the brother. Okay? Does that make sense? Sure. Where were we? Oh, first John two, two ten. ten. <laughs> Who's got that? First John two ten. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion or no cause of stumbling in him. Okay. Define that for me. Hmm. Explain that verse. Hmm. I don't. I don't. There's no. Well, if you're abiding in the light, you're not going to stumble because you're going to be hearing his voice and you're going to do what he says. And you're not going to tell anyone else to stumble either. That too. If you abide in the light, you're going to love your brother. Now, I exactly. Now, I don't know if any of you parents have ever had this moment. 
all of a sudden you realize that your children are saying are having an ungodly attitude because you first showed them how to have an ungodly attitude. You know, that was a humble moment as a parent when one of my kids did something and I'm like, oh, oh, wait a minute, that sounds like me. And it wasn't godly. And it's like, oh, I got so far to go. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. So you got that? Key, key verses. Love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's a whole sermon right there. Well, for Bill, it may have been three weeks. <laughs> when, you're lucky. When, he, <laughs> when he taught it. There's so much in there, but let me ask you one question. What's the world? In this, in this context, we're not talking about the planet spinning and being at a 23 degree angle in the sun and all that. What is this referring to? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So Wayne, I'm sure you recognize what those were what in the back in the Old Testament times. Those were gods of the Canaanites and others. If you yeah, go it's back, also, and it's also the temptation that the devil gave to Eve. Genesis sure. two ten. Yeah, but uh, Baal, the Ashtoreth, and Molech. Also, they were key on those sins. But also, yes, go back to Genesis. So, it's about the sin nature. It's about the inherited nature. That's the world, is the inherited nature. I, I mean, Melissa has a saying about those who people who are deceived. Melissa, do you wish to quote it? Those who are deceived don't know they're deceived because they're deceived. Yeah. And I'm not excusing it, nope. but people but who don't know the Lord and haven't had that Adamic nature washed out by the blood of Jesus, hasn't, haven't had, had died to that nature and lived to Christ, can't help but do what they do. Now, some of them are very moral. <coughs> but in the end, is it, can it be moral enough for God? No. No. So that's what this is talking about, is if you display the things of the flesh... Got to ask self question. Well, I've just always been a Christian. Oh, really? Well, maybe we need to find when that really happened. He's calling into question. Think what's going on in this church. Divisions, heresies. The Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle John, is calling into question if you're behaving like this, you're not behaving like Jesus or what he said or what the Gospels, which were already out in the circulation, say Jesus said you should behave. You've got to call into question your motives and where you're coming from with what you're saying. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. What should be the impact of this? If we are in the, just think of agape love coming down like a two foot wide stream of water. And I'm standing in the middle of it, bathed in God's love. And it's just doing things to me. What should those things be? What should those things be? Trent, the next verse. Oh. First John 4, 17 and 18. <laughs> like, Trent, wait, I'm, not I'm leaving. I'm not here. <laughs> First John 4, 17 and 18. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. All right. What's the first thing being in the center that God be in love should do for me? Boldness. Boldness? Okay. Boldness in what context, Adrian? Um, it says we that <clears throat> love has been perfected among us in that in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? In my, I wrote down some notes on this on these couple of verses. It's when it talks about so we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. It's like a child to a parent versus a criminal to a judge. When a child is getting uh, uh, corrected by his parents, he still knows that his parents love him. However, if a criminal is getting judged by the judge. 
the judge has no ties to that criminal, so he's going to get whatever, whatever he, whatever the judge is going to give him. There's more mercy from the parent than the okay. judge. Okay. These are all good. These are these are these are hammering all around the item here. Let's go back to what Adrian said about boldness. Okay. In verse 17, by this love is perfected with us that we may have. Now you're in what version? New King James. New King James. Melissa NIV. Confidence. Confidence. New American Standard. Confidence. Anyone have it different? It really is assurance more than anything else. Confidence. If I'm in the middle of this agape love and if I truly understand, what can man possibly, possibly do to me? What can any of you or anyone do to me? Melissa could could get on a lying streak and say that I've stolen money, I've robbed, I've pillaged, I've done all this, and they send me to prison and put me on the gallows. Should I fear that? No. Because the the vapor of time we're here on this planet, she isn't going to do that, right? I hope not. Okay. (laughs) The vapor of time on this planet pales in insignificance considering eternity. And that he died for me His blood washed me of my sins. What can shake my foundation of my belief? If I truly believe this, should I fear? Should I fear the world? Should I fear eternal punishment? Let's back up. Let's go to the key one. Should I fear eternal punishment? Why not? His love is perfected in you. True. How thorough was Jesus' blood that was spilled to erase my sins? Completely. Complete. Is there any way one's going to slip through and say, Aha! Got you! Yeah, you're going to come my way, pal, because I found one Jesus didn't wash. No. There's nothing with that great of assurance on this planet. I mean, we've, we've been together 41 years, I mean, and, and I'm pretty confident of Melissa's love for me and my love for her, but it it, it's like a, an ant compared to an elephant compared to uh, the confidence that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. So, what should be my attitude towards judgment? Fear. No fear. No fear. That then makes me bold. I have confidence. I'm not like, well, you need Jesus. No. I know what he's done. I can bolt. Have you ever wondered how those early Christians went to the Colosseum, saw lions coming out to tear them up, and they were singing hymns as they were being torn up by lions? They were camped out in this. They knew. I shouldn't fear man. Does that make sense? They had a confidence in eternity through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. Also, God's grace was poured out on them in their time of need. God does that. Uh, and this is the theory I have, is that we, we know someone, bless their heart, they're, I mean, they had a horrific situation with, a, with a, the birthing of a baby. And the baby died. But you could just see it all around them. Just, I mean, agape was just pouring out through them. They were counseling people coming, <laughs> this couple. Because God's love was just... I mean, just like a fire hose just pouring out through them on everyone. They were right in the middle of agape. Their confidence wasn't shaken. They were able to bless others through that. All right. Another outcome. The second outcome is love for the brethren. 1 John 2, 9. Let's go back to that. Who is that? Now you'll use, I know, the NIV, but that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, no imperfection version? Yes, <laughs> no imperfection version. Oh, that's good, Robert. I'll get that one. That's very good. Much better than nearly inspired. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Nearly inspired is more accurate. Yeah. The idea is good in some translations. Go ahead. In some, some versions. Go ahead. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. Okay. Mine says brother. Yours says brother. Anyone have it any differently? New King James's brother, Adrian? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. That word brother is the word Adelphos. Okay, again, I mean, whoo, we know some Greek. I mean, it's not that. It's just getting back to the root of these words. Because these things, remember, when someone said agapeo, back then, they knew exactly what that meant. That didn't mean brotherly love. That didn't mean it, it meant a certain thing. 
And we kind of lose a little bit of that in some of our English. But anyway, Adelpheo, it means brother of brothers, kinsmen or relatives. But importantly in the New Testament, it means someone else who is of the word. It really implies that. And it is used throughout uh, 1 John, and it really is implying about members of the Christian community. Again, people of the word. So let's go look at a few of these verses. Go back to you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. We just read 2 9, but let's read it again. 1 John 2 9 through 11. Again, this is what? Oh. What? But, 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 yes, ma'am. She's got her Bible open waiting to read it. I'm I sorry. I, I was just following along. You can go on. <laughs> no, no, no. I would not. would not so rob sorry. you of that. I, I, I'm, I'm so I, I apologize. First John 2 <laughs> 9 through 11. Lydia? We just read that. We're reading we're it again. again. <laughs> I don't repeat myself, repeat myself off. Mm -hmm. yeah. If anyone claims I am living in the light but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. Okay. What is this telling us? Again, the word there is agape, and the opposite is hate. Your version nailed that word in the say of it, hate. Um, it's contrasting those. What else does it tell us about this? They're deceived. They're deceived. Think about it. Someone's teaching a heresy, and they're just being nasty and snitty towards people, and you go, oh, wait a minute, are you in the light? Because hatred, bitterness, stuff like that is not what the Holy Spirit pours out through us. I like the way her person said that um, there's nothing in him to make the brother stumble. Is that what it said on uh, verse 10? Um, and anyone who loves another brother or sister is looking in light and does not cause others to stumble. Yeah, does not cause others to stumble. Yes. So, yeah. And that is important. Mm -hmm. Anything else in that? Okay, Rilla, if you've got 1 John 3, Tim. Um, <coughs> so now we can tell who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and who does not love other believers does not belong to God. Whoa! Ouch. Now we're stomping on our toes real hard. Again, John's in absolutes. Okay, the Holy Spirit, penned through the Apostle John to this church, is putting things in absolutes. What are the two absolutes you just read? What's of the devil? Unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Unrighteousness? And unloving, not loving. And unloving. Unloving and unrighteousness is of the devil. And what's of God? Doing what's right. right. Doing what's right and loving the brother. Loving the brother. So, is there any gray zone in this? Yep. Let's, let's keep hammering along here. Plus the first John 3, 11 and 12. How about you? <laughs> I, I, talk, I talk enough. <laughs> first John 3, 11 and 12, Melissa. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Okay. The word beginning there. Is, all, is everyone, every translation have it that way? What beginning is this talking about? Beginning of the world. Beginning of the world? Beginning of mankind. Beginning of man, well, yeah, beginning of mankind. How do we know that that's what this is referring to and not, oh, the beginning of the apostolic age or the beginning of this, the beginning of that? He goes all the way back to Cain. To Cain. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. He references Jealousy. back to Cain. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So, were we told from the beginning by God that we should love and not hate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it's not a new concept. It's not something new. I mean, it should have been something that was known. Adrian, 1 John 3 14 and 15. 
We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Wait a minute. Time, time out. Time out. Now, this wasn't a church with zombies walking around dead. And what, what is this really talking about? You, you can refer, although I try to stick to First John, we can refer to some writings in Romans on this issue. You're talking about heart issues. Yeah. What did Paul say? That when we were slaves to sin... We were dead to righteousness, right? We're dead in our trespasses. We were dead. When it comes to eternal life, we were dead. And then Jesus raises us to newness of life, right? So that's the death is talking about. Again, total contrast here. Life, death. No in between. Life, death. What else does it say? What does it say about, um, about the brethren in this? Hatred and murder are the same thing. Hatred and murder. Do you remember anyone else kind of drawing a similar conclusion? Maybe in the Sermon on the Mount? I never will forget, there was, we had this, we didn't have a lot of money when we lived out there in um, Gravel Ridge, remember? Mm. But we scraped up some money and bought this little metal building, I think from Sears. I mean, the strong wind, the thing would fall over. But anyway, it was to put our lawnmower in and stuff. And so, I got some sacks of concrete, made a concrete pad to put this thing on. Of course, it was not square or level. But anyway, it, you know, and I laid out all the metal pieces and Melissa said, you gotta come in and eat. So, okay, I came in and eat and got distracted and some neighborhood kids came over and started bouncing up and down on the metal walls. <laughs> I went, those idiots! <laughs> Melissa's mother almost had a coronary right there. She pulled me aside, Jesus said, don't say that. You're, you're gonna be guilty of hellfire. <laughs> And I was like, but they're idiots! Look at them. <laughs> <clears throat> but in that moment, my attitude towards those young boys was not of righteousness. My attitude was fury. My attitude was not holy. And Jesus warned us against that, right? He said, even if you say raka, which meant empty head. <laughs> I had empty head. Wayne calls me rock all the time on the phone. But anyway, you know, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> but even just to say that, Jesus said... No, he's saying you rock. That's yeah. what he's no! <laughs> You rock. Wait a minute. Yes. Is that Italian ah on the end? <laughs> but you mean if I just call someone an empty head, I'm going to go to hell? Is that what Jesus meant when he said that? What did it mean? It was the hard attitude of exactly. hate. <laughs> if I am sitting in the middle of agapeo, I'm not going to have that attitude. If I am having that attitude, am I really in the flood of God's love? Am I really a believer? Now, you're saying, well, wait a minute. If you have a habit of doing that, how many times is a habit made? If I'm, am I a murderer if I only kill one person? Or am I a murderer if I kill ten? Or, oh, I'm a murderer if you kill 12. How many times did it take to be a murderer? Once. Once. What word is used in this passage? Murder. Right? Yeah. See, what John is pointing out, again, the Holy Spirit pinned through the Apostle John to this church in Asia Minor is, by their actions, especially when the heat is turned up, you find out what they really are. What do you see coming out? What do you see when the pressure's on? What do you see when you hear someone saying things about your wife? Or you hear someone say, you're just an idiot, <laughs> or whatever. What, what comes out tells you where they are. And it's either death or life. There's no in between. Okay. First John... What did you read? Uh, 14 and 15. Okay. Jenny, can you do 16 and 18? First John 3, 16 and 18. 16 and or through? Okay. Through. Okay. through. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, 
but in deed and in truth. All right. So how far does our love go? All the way down our far? actions. All the way down our love. Actions speak. Actions speak louder than words. Melissa's dad had this little plaque. It's this from Benjamin Franklin. Well done is better than well said. Mm -hmm. uh, it applies here. How far should you go as far as loving another brother? At the cost of your yeah. very life. At, even up to the cost of your very life, if that's what's required. That's pretty heavy to toll, I think. Well, let's keep going. First John 4, 11. Dear friends, since God, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. I like that word, surely. <laughs> And it's not with a capital S. Don't call me Shirley. Don't call me Shirley. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's not that kind of Shirley. It sounds like an appeal, doesn't it? Come on. Yep. All of the dear friends. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 there's a lot of this in, in there. I think there must have been something going on. Wayne, First John 4.12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. All right. So now we get back to the hippie. Oh, I love, I love, therefore, you know, I, I must have God in me or something. You know, this leads to all kinds of human, I mean, animism and all these other isms about just love is God. Now, that's the card before the horse. The cart is God is love, and he pours it out through us, and therefore the world can see it. Not, because there's love in the world, there must be a God. No, God distributes and dispenses the love through the Holy Spirit through us. So if we gather up all the love in the world, does that equal God? No. He's the source of it. <clears throat> Remember, the pipeline flows this way, from, from heaven down. And they want so badly for it to be the other way, though. I, I, I was just thinking, I've got this girl on my Facebook that I went to high school with, and at first I thought she she's Buddhist, but now I think she's more just <coughs> some some Far Eastern religion. And it's always, she's always talking about love. Of course, God's never in it. Um, and it's like, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's it, she's making love kind of like God. I don't know. It's, 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 and of course, when anything pressures her, it's not love that comes out. You know, it's, it's pretty hateful. Yeah, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of pagan religions, mm -hmm. which is all about putting yourself in, a, in, a, in an environment where you just love each other and, you know, you, you keep out anything that's, I mean, this is why you have these religious communes. communities and communes is to keep out the things that would cause you to go you know and get all upset so yeah yeah first john 4 19 through 21 sure we love because he first loved us if someone says i love god and hates his brother he is a liar the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love god whom he has not seen and this commandment we have from him that the one who loves god should love his brother also I don't think we need to diagram those verses. They're, they're pretty ex self-explanatory, right? Okay, let's go to the outcome. Uh, let's go to another of the outcomes. Well, one of the outcomes was that we would not have fear. Another the outcome of being in the center of agape. Just think of it as a giant fire hydrant of water coming down. You're in the middle of that love of God. It's going to cause you to not have fear. It's going to cause you to love the brother, and it's going to do something else. First John 5, 3, 80. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay, so explain that. You do what he says because it's easy. Because it's easy and you want to. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, if Melissa asks me to do certain things around the house, I mean, it's drudgery to me to want to go do it. But on things I want to do, I go do them, and I'm just happy to do them. You know, you have things like that. Let's go clean the toilet. Uh, well, no, <laughs> I think I've got to go watch a football game. <laughs> but let's go fix dessert. Oh, I'm, I'm right up there, ready to, ready to get the flour out and the sugar and everything else. You know, I think this is what they're saying. You, you just want to. What's the opposite? Remember, 
If there's a truth in the Bible, the opposite is also true. What's the opposite of this? You don't want to. If you don't want to, if God's commandments are a burden, then you may need to question some things. Is that being too judgmental? Anything else? It's the word. Okay, let's go. First John 3.23. Bill. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. Pretty straight up, Pretty isn't straightforward. It? Pretty straight up. I mean, first thing, believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Number two on the list. Love one, one another. another. Okay, first John, maybe we're going to find a verse to get us out of this. Um, Tom, first John 4, 21. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. I can't escape this. Okay, first John 3. Two, three, three, nine. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him, ought also himself also so to walk, even as he walked, meaning Jesus. Beloved brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brethren, is in darkness, even until now. Absolutes again. Right? Yep. And he restated. But he didn't say, I issued a new command. He basically says, I'm restating this, just so you get it straight. If you hate your brother... You're in the darkness. All right. Now we can talk about salvation and and we can talk about you know karma Christians and all this. John was just basically saying, Holy Spirit through John to that church in Asia Minor was saying, we've got factions, we got splits, we got people in war in the church. If you don't love your brethren, if both of you are so hateful, maybe none of you are so is the way I would interpret this. All right, let's, let's really start stomping our toes. Let's look at application. We've already talked about the heresies that were around at that time. And we had, you know, disagreements in and I, Okay, I don't want hands up. Have you ever been in a, a church? Thank you, Melissa. I forgot to do that. Pull it gently. Remember, I pulled it apart last week. I still have it fixed, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, you ever been in a church situation where there's a a split, what we know is a church split. Things got ugly. That's what was happening in Asia Minor at this time. Remember how he just wanted to puke? <laughs> but to put it, I don't, I don't know what the Greek word is for puke, but I mean, we were involved puke. in one. And I, I, just, I just literally, I wanted to throw up and go. I, I, just, I, didn't want to, I, I didn't want to be on winning team A or winning team B. I just wanted to throw up and leave. It made me feel so bad. But were those loving events? Were those just, oh, I know I disagree with you and you're just full of calmer when it comes to the Bible, but I love you! <laughs> no, those were awful. And that's what was happening. But let's take this a step further. How are we to respond to fellow believers? Have you ever walked in the room? As soon as you walked in and you even said two words, you know. You know that you don't know that person, but you know. Whatever the word, you can just feel it. Okay? That's agape kind of like tuning force. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you this question. This is question number three. This is hard. This is hard for me. Is there anyone who is a believer that if they walked in this room, you would find yourself wallowing in misio. 
wallowing in bitterness. I'm not going to look at anybody because I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at me. I think this is what we have to ask ourselves. Remember, what is the purpose of the scripture? 2 Timothy 3.16. What is the purpose of the scripture? Wayne, I know you know that verse. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for proof. For proof. And? Correction. Correction. Why? Training in righteousness. For reproof. The word of God is here. It's like a rudder in our life. That, you know, if you try to get from here to a specific point over across Lake Erie, if you're off by one degree on your compass, that's just... 60 miles across a lake. If you're off by one degree, you're going to miss it by half a mile. Occasionally, you check your GPS or your map and you do course correction, right? Or if you're trying to fly from here, let's say from here to Dallas, and you go, Dallas is exactly 222 degrees from here, or whatever it is. And you get up in the plane and you take off. And don't take into consideration the winds, the prevailing winds. You may wind up in Louisiana and not in Texas. <laughs> it's not where you want to be. This is the purpose. This is the purpose of the Word of God. Is course correction. It's to inform the, 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 the uninformed. But really, this book is for the believer, for course correction. And folks, I struggle with this. I mean, it's just like, I mean, if, if, if question number three there poked you in the heart with a little pen, you're not alone. The other thing, what message do we send to our biological children and spiritual children if we are hating other believers? Hating on other believers. Go back to what Jesus said about the about the about the servant that was forgiven. Remember about the, the servant who was the, it was a parable, but a servant who was forgiven it was, it was like 160,000 years worth of wages. Something like that. It was astronomical. Was forgiven of that. And the, and the king just wiped out that debt and said, Look, you're debt free now. And he went and threw a guy in jail who owed a day's wages. Owed him a day's wages. And then what did the king do? He locked him up. He, he's, he's turned him over to the torturers. Now, does that mean if I hate someone, Jesus is going to throw me down to the devil and the devil's going to whip on me for, for a few years or whatever? No, it, it was a parable. But what it says is, if you were in a gapeo, if you're in a gapeo, You've been forgiven of everything. How dare you consider holding something against somebody else? That's what this is saying. That's what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach this church. Is that in the absence of love, it's just going to fall apart. But those who are showing true God and love will forgive, will forget, will, will, will basically do what the New Testament says for reproof, for correction. Matthew 5, 43 through 46, we're not going to go to it, but, but uh, Jesus instructed us there in number four. It says to agapeo your enemies. That's not just phileo love. Man, that's a brotherly love your enemies. Since even the tax collectors love those who are like them. If we, you, you got you know, guys at bar, you know, they're all, you know, they're drinking and they're carousing and whatever. Oh yeah, let's go down to another bar. I mean, they really like each other. Even those guys know how to like each other. And we got Christians who won't even go across the room and shake hand with each other. Okay, I'm speaking to me. All right. Again, the purpose of the word is to correct us, to reproof, and the word should change us. Proverbs 12.1. I think we'll stop there. Sorry, we're a couple minutes over again. I apologize, guys. You know, Paul, hey, the, the thing that keeps jumping out at me is, when, you know, even in these commands where he's telling us to love our enemies and all this stuff, it, it takes away that emotion that we all feel we have to have in order to be able to have the warm fuzzies it's an action. It's choosing to do what's right for the other person. 
at your expense many times yes. because if you're ha if you're ha struggling with loving somebody because they're your enemy, you have to die to your flesh to go serve them and do what Jesus has commanded you to do. And so I think sometimes we feel like hypocrites because we're doing it, we don't feel like it. But no, it's obedience. We're obeying Him. Yes. We're serving Him because He tells us to do that. That's true. How many warm fuzzies do you think Jesus had as he was going down go towards Golgotha? Oh, I'm sure he didn't have too many. It was not warm and fuzzy, God. but it was, but it, but he was right in the center of God's will because he was obedient, even right. to the point of death. Let's look at Proverbs 12, 1. Proverbs 12, 1 says this. This goes back to 2 Timothy 3, 16. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. In my version, what does NIV say? Yeah, it's so stupid. Stupid. <laughs> stupid. <laughs> stupid. <laughs> Wayne, new, uh, King James? Correction is stupid. Stupid. Correction. New, new, new King James? Same. Yeah. Stupid. Okay, I don't think we need to go to the Hebrew to figure this one out. <laughs> if you won't let the word correct you, as in 2 Timothy 3.16, you're stupid. Your life depends on getting to that point in Canada, and next thing you know, you're going over Niagara Falls because you didn't make a course correction. So to say. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to a point in Canada. Different point. And I went to another point in Canada. Okay. All right. Here's what I suggest we do. You've got homework. You've got homework, and you've got, uh, I think, three or four weeks to get this done. Because Wayne teaches next week. I will be out of town. Wayne's teaching on Philemon next week? Philemon. Okay. Y'all read the book of Philemon this week because we'll be looking at it. Well, then I can't give him any homework. That's a big assignment. It's like a chapter. Uh, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like the introduction to Romans almost. Yeah. I mean, it's small. Um, but what, what I want you to do is read 1 John 4, 7 to 11. Go back and, and Google, Google the Psalms. Anyway, um, I never forget those words. Read through 1 John 4, 7 11. Pray through 1 John 4, 7 11. Ask the Lord if you are showing agape love, if you're walking in agape love. Again, I am stomping on my own toes. I got I got some bruised toenails right now because of all this. Stop stomping out. Well, they got a name for people that hurt themselves, you know. That's true. <laughs> Here, here's the key. The key is. This church, this state, this county, this country is not in a whole lot different shape than that church in Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. We got heresies blowing up all over the place. Mm -hmm. We've got, I won't even talk about the Episcopalians. Let's just leave them out of the equation. But we've got, we've got arguments in some mainstream denominations about sin, about homosexuality, about things like that. I mean, the Word of God's under assault. No different than it was under assault there in Asia Minor. And yes, we can write our congressman. We can, we can pray. Do not discount prayer at all. Mm -mm. We can do all kinds of things. But what John, I think, was pointing out to the church is those of you who are in agapeo, have the love of God through you, in you and through you, let your light shine. Let it shine. That will show the difference. And that's what we're, I think it's what we're held accountable to do. To show the love. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just where we sing that song, just a little light of mine. No. Sherry, you want to stand up and lead us on that? Well, you don't want me to. <laughs> <laughs> she has a better one she can sing, I'm sure. Of like one day at a time. No, no. no. Oh, Broken and spilled out. Okay. <laughs> Prayer requests. Wayne, how's the 